I'm Wendy Wilson, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Realizing Potential. Today, I'm interviewing uh, the new, one of the newest members. Uh, she's uh, been here at Albany State University for a little under three months. I think it's maybe two months and, and a couple days, but we are super excited to have her here. She's working on a very important initiative that impacts our uh, SAX accreditation, which is critical uh, to the sustainability and viability of the institution. And so she is none other than Dr. Katherine Hamm, but we affectionately refer to her as Joy. Joy, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Dr. Wilson? I'm good. I'm good. Call me Wendy. It's good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Thank you and for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. So we were just having a little uh, exchange prior to us uh, actually hitting the record button. And so you were sharing with me that you are from uh, the West Virginia area. Tell us a little bit about where that town is, your background, your educational pursuits, and what led you to this current position that you hold here at Albany State. Sure. So it's actually in Southwest Virginia. So not West Virginia, but the southwestern part of Virginia. Um, it's a little tiny town most people have never heard of called Rural Retreat. Um, and where it's located is, um, if you're familiar with Virginia Tech, we're about 45 minutes southeast of that, excuse me, southwest of that area. Okay, very good. Okay, and so your educational pursuits, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I have a, a bachelor's degree in political science and psychology from Lenore Ryan University in Hickory, North Carolina. I did my master's work at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, um, a master's in counselor education, and then completed my education doctorate EDD um, at Georgia Southern University. Okay, very good. Very good. So you've been in this area for about how long? Um, in this area, higher ed or this area of the, of Georgia? Of Georgia. And then we'll talk about the higher ed piece as well. Cause you, okay. uh, you heard, yeah, go ahead. So, um, I moved to Albany, Georgia in March of this year, actually, but okay. I have, uh, been in the Georgia system at a couple of different institutions. Um, I was at Georgia Southern and at Armstrong before, before the merger of those two institutions. So I'm pretty familiar with the Georgia, Georgia University system. Okay, so you've, you've had that ex, that consolidation life before. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, you know, we have to uh, be patient with ourselves. Uh, and I think Albany State has done well um, in the process. You, you want it to happen overnight because you want to, again, move to the, uh, the initiative that will help, you know, uh, create bigger and better. Yeah. Um, and well, I shouldn't say bigger and better because bigger doesn't always necessarily mean better, but just to improve and advance the, the processes that mm -hmm. you have in place. So we have to remind ourselves, be patient. It takes time. Yes, definitely. Yes. So I'm curious, tell me a little bit about um, what intrigued you about this position that you currently hold here at Albany State University and what does that entail? So I um, have worked for about 19 years in higher education before coming to Albany State, and I've worked on both student affairs and enrollment management. But a lot of the initiatives in both of those areas that I worked directly with were student success. Uh, retention, progression, graduation, how we enhance and improve those. And so when I saw that Albany State's QEP was focused on student success and really moving that needle um, for progression and graduation, it seemed like a good fit of my past experiences, my interests, um, and that I could really help the institution in moving some of those things forward. Now, some of our viewers may be unfamiliar with what QEP, that acronym, stands for mm -hmm. and what it entails. So let's, let's educate them. Sure. So QEP stands for Quality Enhancement Plan. It's a five-year plan that is institution-wide, and it gives institutions an opportunity to find a key issue that can enhance student success on their campus and really make a concerted effort in trying to make those improvements. And it's a part of our accreditation process with the um, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, Commission on Colleges, or as we call it, SAC COC. And so as we go through this reaccreditation process, we have to successfully implement that quality enhancement plan. Very good. And so again, um, student success is our primary focus. 
Tell us a little bit about that package. What are we doing to ensure that we are uh, developing and advancing in that area and that we meet the requirements as it relates to the accredita- accreditation process? Because it's not just a, an overnight process. It's, uh, as you, the operative word, I, I believe, is planning. Yes. So um, the QEP is just one part of the overall accreditation process. Accreditation is really intended to ensure the public that a college or university um, has a commitment to integrity, um, that we're providing effective programs and services. Um, And when we go through this process, which is really rigorous, um, and we achieve that reaccreditation, it means that we have an, uh, an appropriate mission Um, that we are using resources and programs to accomplish our mission, um, that we have clear educational objectives, um, and that we're successful in assessing our achievement of those objectives. So the objectives for the QEP um, are really that um, we're going to enhance our progression and our graduation rates. And we're doing that through five different strategies. And what are those, will you share what those strategies are? Sure, absolutely. So one is progress reports and progress reports um, relate to our students who are either on academic probation or our first year students and their faculty are looking for indicators that maybe they're starting to struggle a little bit in their classes. Maybe they've stopped coming to class, they're not doing as well on their assignments. And so the faculty member refers that student to their student success coach or their academic advisor who's going to try to figure out what's going on with that student and get them connected to resources so they can really get back on track. Um, th- that leads me to this one of the other strategies, which is our advising model. Um, we now have an advising model where students who have less than 60 hours are advised by a student success coach. Um, and students who have more than 60 hours then transition to a faculty advisor. This model lets those individuals really focus on where on where their strengths are. So a student success coach is helping a student get through their core curriculum, adjust to the institution, learn our policies and procedures, whereas a faculty advisor who's an expert in their content area is really going to be focused on major coursework, but also thinking more long term internship opportunities, career and graduate school. Um, The third um, strategy is our uh, first year experience course and the incorporation of peer mentors into that course. We've redesigned that course. Um, It's being implemented for the first time this fall. And each of those courses has a peer mentor or a P3 assigned. And that student is really there to provide some extra assistance, extra mentorship, really help our first year students feel connected to our institution. In addition to that, we are redesigning 11 other courses. Those are courses that have really high enrollment, but oftentimes they also have a high rate of students who are either withdrawing from the course for some reason, or maybe they're earning a D or F as the grade in that course. And so we wanna make sure that we are looking at the content and structure of those classes and how we can help students be more successful. And those 11 courses range from English to biology to math. So they're really touching a variety of areas of the campus. And I think I've told you four now. Um, We've talked about course redesign, first year experience and peer mentors, advising model and progress reports. And the fifth one, just left my head for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It'll it'll come back to you. Yes. But what I what I've been struck by um, j- just in you in you sharing the, those four is that, and, and I'm thinking like, well, we we do all of those well. But what it sounds like I'm hearing is that now uh, we've brought some cohesion, if you will. We've bridged them and, and connected them, which would then yield even even greater success. Um, I, I also love the piece. A lot of uh, our students and a lot of institutions see this across the country uh, where there may not have been any post-secondary education exposure into the household or someone to example or mirror what those processes are. Um, and so then what winds up happening, you, you know, you have fledgling students. I don't know how, what do you mean, go to my instructor and ask them what, because there might be the thought or, or the mindset, well, they'll think that I don't understand and I should already have an understanding. 
Um, that's that's separate and apart from the actual learning uh, mm -hmm. of the content, whatever that course might be. So there are many hats that you have to wear as a, as a student. So having um, coaches and mentors and people to kind of guide you through all of that and then working in concert, again, the yield and, and uh, the success rate and increases exponentially. So I love that we have something comprehensive, if you will, um, to, to partner and join with um, ensuring the success of, our, success of our students. And that just, you just triggered what the fifth one is. It's okay. study tables. So we've always had tutoring on campus uh, and a writing center and a math lab and things like that. But we really wanted to provide additional opportunities for students who might be struggling in a class to get some support. And so there are about 30 different courses that offer study tables. Um, and in the past, uh, last semester, they were only offered um, two nights per week, and they were face-to-face -face prior to campus having to go to remote learning. But with the shift to hybrid model and, and a new campus environment, um, study tables are now actually going on four nights a week this, this semester. Uh, and they're being offered both in person and virtually so that no matter what format a student is taking their classes in, they can get that extra assistance either one-on-one -on -one or small group from a faculty instructor or from a peer mentor in one of those courses. You, you made me think um, uh, during when we had to go remote uh, as a result of the pandemic, and that was one of the concerns. I, I serve on the president's cabinet, um, and that was she wanted to stress that how are we going to still maintain a, a high level of engagement and provide uh, students with that support? And so I've been personally struck by the idea that we saw the numbers, Dr. Peters, who is our, our protost, provost, Angel Peters, and vice president of academic affairs, uh, you know, and should and proudly always shares that the numbers went up significantly um, as a result of students tapping in and saying, hey, um, I, this has benefited me and this is serving me. Uh, and let me take greater advantage. So there's a requirement, I understand that if you fall into a certain demographic in terms of needing some additional academic support that you have to attend, I think it's two sessions, but she's, um, uh, students have demonstrated, regardless of that two minimum requirement, I want more. And so mm -hmm. we've seen a huge success uh, as a result of that. So I'm excited about what QEP uh, brings not only to, I know we, we um, kind of anchor ourselves on, okay, we've got to do this in terms of accreditation, but never losing sight of the fact of the huge impact that it has, which, and I, I think this is a certain, certainly a great cause, if you will, or a selection, that's probably a better word, the um, and connecting with the students and the whole student success initiative is just, is, it's paramount and it permeates every aspect of, of the institution's success. Yes, that's what makes this opportunity for me to be the QEP uh, director so exciting is it involves every corner of campus life and, yes. and I get to sort of help make sure we're making all of those connections and really serving our students at the highest level possible. Very good. Uh, I've had an opportunity to participate. Um, I always enjoy the meetings related to QEP. I serve on that committee. Don't always make them all as I, I'd love to. But the last one, you said something um, and I was like, OK, I've got to remember that. And then how can I have a, a greater role in making that impact? You said when the when they uh, the assessors, if you will, come on campus and the, for the SACS accreditation, SAC COC accreditation, they could ask anyone in their path or their line of sight, tell me about QEP. And ideally, we want them to be able to articulate intelligently what that is. Right. So kind of capture, um, make it digestible for, you know, the, the average student just walking along who's focused on being a, a chemistry major. Now you're telling me I need to learn something else and it's going to have an impact on the institution that I'm matriculating. So what, how would you uh, educate that student? I think making it personal for that student. Um, this is an institution-wide effort, and it can seem, you know, big and overwhelming when I come in and talk to you, you know, in a class about it for 15 or 20 minutes. But I think helping students really understand that, you know, if if that is a student in a chemistry class, we have chemistry. Um, 
tutors available at those study tables. And so you might not be a first year student, you know, first year experience might not be impacting you, but being able to get that assistance at that study table um, for your chemistry class. And you don't have to be failing the class to go and get help. Maybe you um, are, um, you have a, a C and you, you know, you're thinking about medical school and you'd like to have a B or even better an A in that course. Going to that study table is going to help you. And so I, I think help, helping students make those connections about what is happening in the QEP that is personal to them is, is going to help them understand what we're really trying to do, um, that it's really about their individualized success and what pieces of the QEP fit and work for them and can help them achieve their ultimate goals. Very good. So now let's speak to, we've, we've addressed the students that also impacts the faculty and staff. So if we could speak to them, give us a timeline. What do we need to do in preparation and how can we, um, again, the goal is to have a successful yield. What is our role? So um, the timeline is that um, we've already had our offsite review. So we've sent tons of documents and information um, to reviewers to look at and do an, a sort of an initial assessment. And anything that they saw that they still had lingering questions about, they've let us know what those are. So when they come to campus, which will happen um, in March, it's March 8th through 11th, um, they'll be meeting with a variety of campus constituents, faculty, staff, and students. And so um, between now and then, um, getting to know as much as you can about that accreditation process, understanding what's going to happen when the reviewers come. If we call upon you, um, you know, and say, we will we'll really need you to attend this meeting, um, you know, being open and, and, um, and, and helping us uh, fill those seats in those meetings, um, and then being present and available during that review process is what's going to be really helpful. We'll be doing a variety of meetings where we'll be talking with faculty and staff about the process, um, helping prepare them so that they aren't walking into these meetings completely blind. We wanna make sure that you have the information and resources you need um, to be able to speak with the reviewers while they're here. Um, and so you'll be seeing a lot more information coming out both from me and from Dr. McMurray, our Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness, about those opportunities to learn more about the process and what, what your role will actually be in it. Um, and then just helping in terms of the QEP, um, just helping to support it. You know, if you're a faculty member, you might not be leading a study table, but letting students know that study tables are available. Um, if you are in the counseling center, you may be getting that phone call from a student success coach saying, hey, we have a student who's struggling. We really think they could benefit from your services, helping us close those loops. So really just um, helping us implement the strategies that we think will help our students be more successful. Very good, very good. And again, um, it's it's been normalized. That's what we do on a daily basis. But again, just kind of connecting those those services, if you will, and in this structure, I think it's going to be huge. I'm really excited about it and, and excited that you're leading the effort. So thank you for the work. I know you hit the ground running um, and, you know, had to do a little catch up because uh, that position had been vacant for a little bit. So hats off to you. Um, I'm excited about uh, what the what the outcomes will yield. Um, I always ask, <clears throat> excuse me, my guest, um, two questions. And so I gave you a little homework assignment, but it, it helps me and helps our viewers have a better understanding and, and not just the, the Dr. Ham that, that comes to work and does a QEP, but we are well-rounded in individuals or work to strive to be that way. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about you um, as a person. And so my first question to you is to share with the viewers a book that has most impacted your life outside of your preferred religious text and why? Um, when you asked me this, I had to really stop and think because there, I'm an avid reader oh, of great. fiction and nonfiction. And so I really had to sort of stop and, and think about, gosh, if I only had to pick one. Yes. So I chose one that's really impacted my professional work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the book, Good to Great. Um, and one of the things that really struck me when I read that book is uh, about being in the right seat on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who has supervised staff in the past, mentored graduate assistants, sometimes people aren't successful in what they're doing, not because 
of their skill set or knowledge or something internal to them. It's that we haven't put them in the right seat on the bus. Um, and if we put them in a different um, seat, they might be much more successful. And so really trying to figure out what that person wants um, and how can we make that fit in our organization so that we're getting the very best of them and they're giving us um, and, th and they feel as though they're getting the very best back from us in return. So I that's agree. been a big uh, impact in my professional life. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me that I was um, speaking to a, a friend earlier today and um, also wears many hats in my life. And so he, he's also really a great mentor. And he, he had to remind me of that. Um, so again, that was that was just confirmation. I think what happens is a lot of times um, when organizations are resource strapped, and I'm not necessarily talking about finances, um, just resource in terms of your, your human capital. And when you get in the practice of wearing multiple hats as an individual, um, then as either the supervisor or the leader, um, you want them to hone in on this one particular area because it meets their needs and they're wearing so many hats but we've not also allowed for a mastery um, mm -hmm. of, of all of those. So you're absolutely right. Um, and you do yourself a disservice when, when you operate um, in that realm. So again, identifying what it is, what is your greatest contribution to the organization? And let's, let's run with that. And if that means moving you over to that seat, um, let's do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That is a great, that is a great book. So now I don't know if you like to cook or not. So if you do not, you can certainly order in from your favorite restaurant. But share with the viewers, um, you're hosting a dinner. Um, you get to invite three individuals that uh, we may or may not know on an international or national scale. Who would those individuals be? Um, why would you select them? And then what are you serving for dinner? So... Um this was somewhat of a timely question because with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, she would be on my list. Oh. Um, I, I didn't actually know a lot about her until the movie about her life came out a yeah. couple of years ago. I mean, I sort of knew RBG, you know, the, Notorious. the Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Uh, but after I watched that movie and, and learned more about her life, I was so intrigued by all of the things that she has done. Um, and so having the opportunity to sit down with her and, and ask questions about the things I learned there, I think would be um, really amazing. Sure. Um, I would also, I have just finished talking about books and influence on my life. I've actually just finished Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. Mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoyed that book because she was really vulnerable um, yeah. about a lot of things in her personal life and moments that she felt like she wasn't being a good mother and arguments that she and, and the president had. And um, I admired and respected her even more after having um, read that book. And so being able to to talk to her and 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 learn more about um, about those um Parts of her life, I think, would be really intriguing as well. Um, in terms of what I would serve, um, I, you know, I grew up in the South where food is love. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do like to cook. Um, and probably one of the dishes that I make the most um, that gets the most compliments is actually my homemade lasagna. Oh. And so it's not fancy. It's, um, you know, you serve it with salad and garlic bread. But um, I just... It, I feel like I'm at home when I when I eat that meal and share it with others. I love it. Well, um, the, the key is it doesn't matter the dish is, is the love and the energy that that's put into the dish. Um, two, two remarkable and amazing uh, women. Uh, and I guess I've been I've been vacillating in mood the last couple of days. And I know that that's part of it is the, the loss of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and just her impact, but you reminded me, and I, I've shared this story several times, um, just a testament to her entire life and uh, never um, just going after what she wants and not accepting what has been presenting to her, mm -hmm. just kind of still navigating the process. But her life reminds me of this, this gentleman who was being interviewed post Hurricane Katrina um, in New Orleans, and the devastation of the impact and just, keep continuously hitting roadblocks. Everybody was in need 
of, of resources and just trying to bring some semblance of normalcy back to their lives. And he, uh, the interviewer said, well, you, you, you just never gave up. You have a level of tenacity. And he said, um, every time I, I heard the word no, then my response to be to them or in my head would be next. So what, what's the next, what's the mm -hmm. next. And so her life certainly uh, mirrors that uh, life philosophy, if you will, uh, how many times did she say no, but if she had not pursued the next, what would our lives then uh, be like, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as women? Uh, so it is such a, such a huge loss that we are still trying to um, process. Um, it's, it's a lot. So yes, yeah, she would have certainly been uh, great. Uh, I would have just been over in the corner practicing my effective communication skills. If you would have me for the dinner, just listening, uh, <laughs> no talking on my part. And yes, uh, Michelle Obama's uh, memoir, you, I did too love her candor and, and transparency. Um, when we see such lofty figures, uh, you think that they are, uh, they lose their, their human, um, mm -hmm. uh, the element. Uh, and so to, to, to read that, that she's like, Oh, I've, you know, you can identify. I experienced that. I experienced that. So yeah. yeah, two great and amazing figures. Thank you so much for this interview today. I've, I've learned um, so much. Um, I'm excited again about your leadership as it relates to the QEP uh, endeavor. It is, it is so very important um, to, um, again, we keep focusing on the SACS piece. Yes, that's huge, but again, student, student success, that's the bedrock of this institution. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have so many great resources, but again, um, packaging them, I think will again, or I know yield a greater success. So let us know the progress that we're making. I know you say March, 2021, it, October is next week. So it'll be here soon. So we yes. still have some work to do uh, before that time. So you're welcome to come back and give us some updates and and then I'm claiming success. So you certainly are welcome to come back afterwards to let us know, yes, it was a home run of victory for us. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Viewers, thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Realizing Potential. I'm Wendy Wilson, and I look forward to seeing you next time.